Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Unlock the Stock. We are really pleased today to welcome CANS back to the platform. This Unlock the Stock platform, as you know by now, is specifically designed for retail investors to get to know the corporate management and the company just a little bit better and to give you access to them. Duncan Lewis, the CEO of CANS, and Franz Reichardt, the CFO, join us today, and Duncan will be taking you through a presentation shortly. Unlock the Stock is not possible without our technology partners, Lumi Global. Please visit their website at lumiglobal.com to learn more about Lumi's various online AGM and investor presentation solutions. Our hosts today will be the Finance Ghost and Mark Tobin of Coffee Microcaps, and they'll facilitate the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Before we start, just a few housekeeping notes. Duncan will take you through a presentation which will be followed by a Q&A. Please note that you can post your questions by typing them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The event is being recorded and will be available on our Unlock the Stock YouTube channel soon. You will see an email address when you get to the Q&A function. If you want to be put onto the CNS contact database, please take note of that email address and you can reach out to them directly. Duncan, that is all from my side and um, I think we can go straight into the presentation which Lumi is going to share for us. So over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I appreciate you being with us. And uh, uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to share with you our results for year ending December with you. Um, I'm just going to cover this briefly around who we are, what we do and why. Um, an update on our full year results, obviously, and then a deeper dive into the different jurisdictions. And then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Franz, who's going to take you into uh, and give you greater detail of the financial statements, and then an update on our journey towards 2026, and then um, you know take questions from the floor. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. Um, you know, it's, it's it's not my first time on this platform, um, and um, but I don't want to assume uh, the audience know who we are. Um, and uh, what we do and why. Um, but very briefly, um, um, what our job is, is we're providing route to market solutions to um, brand owners, primarily in the consumer package goods space. Essentially what that means is um, our clients are looking for um, solutions where we can provide on-shelf availability of their brands in various retail um, environments um, across multiple geographies. Um, secondary, uh, secondly, is that our clients are looking to us for solutions that grow categories and ultimately their positions or um, share of that particular category. Next, please, Andre. The generic solutions we provide are warehousing and distribution, and what we describe as retail execution and advisory, retail support and training, and then technology and data solutions. Next. On the warehousing and distribution, so um, we, we provide warehousing and distribution solutions outside of South Africa. Um, I think that um, it probably goes without saying is that in these geographies where we provide these so-called full service offerings, that we have um, fairly big infrastructures of um, distribution centers, um, of vehicles, of people, um, because what we are trying to do is we're trying to shorten the lead time between the order being placed by the retailer um, and these respective delivery points so that we can deliver to our retailers and to shoppers and consumers within 24 or 48 hours. 
Next. On the retail execution advisory, um, what's, what's important is that when the stock gets delivered at the back door, that we are able to receive that stock and get it to the shelves quickly and efficiently because our clients want to ensure that their, their products are available and visible. But, but more importantly, um, we want to ensure that we have for certain categories, multiple points of interruption, that we can um, grow impulse purchase, and four expandable categories that we're creating as many interruption points um, as possible. Next. On the retail support is that if you look at a retail environment, um, it is driven often by um, promotions, um, and it's our job to ensure that we have the respective promotional material in the store and we are using that to create communication with shoppers and consumers. And sometimes it takes the form of a brand ambassador that is communicating features and benefits of a particular product, creating awareness and giving the shopper and the consumer with as much information as possible so that they can make an informed purchase. Next. On the technology and data, um, we, we have started our digitization journey a, a long time ago, but frankly, it's a journey without end. And um, we are using technology and data to communicate with our 15,000 people but also we're using technology and data to communicate with our clients around a particular market, how their products are performing in a particular market, what competitor activity is, uh, price sensitivity around volumes of particular prices. And we're trying to get from the data, we're trying to get actionable insights so that we can act on these insights and increase sales opportunities and reduce what we would describe as so-called white spaces. Next. <clears throat> if you look at our business, um, you heard me talk about the four generic services, and then you can see the businesses um, that perform these different generic services. Um, you'll see the respective company and the geography that they operate in. Um, and you'll see that businesses operate in more than one, um, so more, more than one uh, generic service. So Witto Trading, we do warehousing and distribution, but also retail execution and advisory. Um, by comparison, if you look at the PNS group, they would only do in-store execution and retail support. They don't do the warehousing and distribution. And then we look at the technology and data solutions that's primarily driven um, through our business called Mac Mobile, where we look after um, 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 the eight businesses, uh, the eight geographies we currently service and a further 16 markets. Next. These are the geographies where um, we have big infrastructures. Um, so the the 15,000 people we employ um, across, are, are across these jurisdictions. And as I said, if you look at the footnote at the bottom, Mac Mobile operate in a further 16 countries where they're performing, um, 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 they're a service provider to um, the likes of um, the beverage companies, whether it is in the beer space um, or the uh, carbonated soft drink space where they are managing the uh, clients' um, sales solutions, the sales force, um, the orders, the collecting of money, et cetera, et cetera. Andre? I think that, you know, um, um, I often get asked about um, our footprint and what we consider priority markets. Um, so, um, you know, our focus is Southern Africa, so that would be South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho, Swaziland. Um, but more recently, um, we um, have prioritized um, East Africa. And, 
you know, I think that our first for, our, our initial foray into East Africa um, is via Zambia um, and, 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 and Kenya. Um, you know, I think that I get asked why we like these markets and why we have prioritized them. Um, outside of South Africa, you know, we've got um, some drivers like, you know, GDP growth of between three and seven percent. Um, we have rapid urbanization and uh, with rapid urbanization um, lends itself to a, a growing um, formal uh, retail footprint and our business model thrives in that environment and um, coupled with the fact that uh, we have a rapidly growing middle class in these geographies, um, albeit off a, a low base, but, um, you know, but when we um, have this environment, it lends itself to our brands. Um, our clients want us to provide credible solutions in the space. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess that's why, um, you know, we by and large have a client-led uh, growth strategy. Andre? The slide is, um, 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 is to give you some sort of insight into our clients. Um, our clients are generally um, um, multinationals and um, leading South African um, manufacturers. Um, these clients would, generally speaking, be um, number one or number two in the categories in which they compete. They're very focused on building long-term brand equity. And um, I think that um, these brand owners um, probably own the top 200 or 220 um, brands in the world. And uh, I guess we're very privileged uh, to, to represent these brand owners. Andre? If you look at the, um, um, the drivers of our business, I think that, um, you know, we have set ourselves an objective of growing at a compound average growth rate of 20%. Um, that is by and large through organic growth. So we're very, very focused on organic growth. And that means growing in existing geographies, um, growing with existing customers, um, and um, growing with existing customers in new geographies. Um, we do have an acquisitive strategy, um, but, um, you know, the acquisitions we, um, I think, have to meet a, a fairly strict criteria. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I was once asked, are we acquisition junkies? Um, uh, absolutely not. Um, and so I think that we um, are happy to do acquisitions provided it meets the framework that we believe has served us well in the past. I think another driver is really around our collaboration with brand owners. So the average client has been with us for um, well over 18 years. Um, as a result of that, um, we understand our clients, their brands, and the role that their brands play in these markets. And so we are embedded in their business. And so when they're doing their brand plans, we are participating in that process. And when they're doing their channel plans, we participate in that too. And both based on their brand and channel plans, we're able to put an operational plan together for implementation. And so I think that we have a combination of very good client understanding and insight. We have a very good understanding of the geographies um, in which we perform. So we understand these geographies very well. We understand the clients very well. And part of our, I guess, driver is that we're an um, executor of um, brand plans. And so we're very meticulous around ensuring that we're delivering operational execution on behalf of these clients. And hopefully, if we do that well, it results in revenue growth, growth it results in volume growth, and uh, 
market share growth for our clients. Thank you, Andre. Um, you know, I think that um, often people under misunderstand our business model. So, um, as I've said, it's our job to provide um, solutions that enable our clients to win in these markets. Um, how we are uh, compensated for providing and implementing these solutions is that, um, first and foremost, we do not make a margin on the product. So we do not buy a product for um, X and sell it for Y. Um, the client determines what the retail selling price is um, with the um, retailer, and we are compensated um, based on a fee that we agree um, with the brand owner. So in other words, we're not making a margin on product, but we're making a margin on the services that we provide the brand owner. Thank you, Andre. Um, I think that um, you heard me talk about um, collaborating with clients around understanding their brands and um, you know what we need to do in these markets. You heard me talk about understanding um, these geographies very, very well. But I think that at the core of it um, um, is our people. So we're very focused in ensuring that we develop capable people and ensuring that these people are equipped with the skills, the tools, and the technology in order to execute their tasks, their tasks efficiently. Um, and I think that once we have got the the people equipped with the right tools and skills, etc., we can expect the operational implementation. So the operational implementation is making sure that our clients' brands are available, they visible, they promoted, and that we maintain these ecosystems in the store. So you know, at the most basic level, we are packing shelves, but it's far more complex than that because we are packing shelves, but also we are forecasting demand based on competitive activity, based on seasonality, based on different promotional grids. And so we need to ensure that we are um, agile enough to respond to all of this and that the retailer system is an accurate reflection of what is happening in the store. So in other words, um, are the stock counts correct? Are the rate of sales correct? And are we adjusting these rate of sales for time of day, week, month, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I also think that <clears throat> um, the objective of um, not only a compound um, average growth rate of 20%, um, that is important, but what's also important for us is that we are um, sustainable, profitable, and predictable. And so we've been very deliberate around evolving um, the mix of services as we journey towards 2026. And so broadly speaking, we have 85% of our revenue coming from warehousing and distribution, and then 15% of it coming from um, um, uh, in-store execution. Our intention is to make sure that we are growing the other set of services, like I said, um, um, retail execution and advisory, the data and technology, to make sure that we have a revenue split of 70 and 30. And if we're able to do that, the margin contribution will be 50-50 um, from those two um, work streams. <clears throat> Next. Next, Andre. Um, this is just some um, financial highlights for the year ending 2023. Um, so if you look at um, revenue, um, we were able to grow revenue by 19.4% to just over 11.3 billion. Um, we were able to grow 
operating profit by just over 40% to 743, 747 million. Headline earnings grew by 28% to 464.8. Headline earnings growth of 25.3% to just short of one rand per share. We declared a dividend of uh, 20, uh, a del del we declared a deliverant of dividend of 19.56 cents, um, which is an increase of 27.4%. Uh, and then we grew net asset value per share um, by over 25%. Next, Andre. I think that on the operating profit, um, you heard me say that we grew operating profit by just over 40%. Um, to 747.3 million. I think that um, um, that was um, a, a little bit flattering in the sense that um, we did an acquisition um, in 23 um, of the Tarburn Corson business in Namibia, and we got a gain on bargain purchase of just over 120 million. Uh, but if we stripped out the gain on bargain purchase, um, we were able to grow operating profit, um, you know, way ahead um, of revenue growth, uh, notwithstanding. Thank you, Andre. If you look at the headline earnings per share growth, um, we were able to grow headline earnings per share by 25.3% to 97.97 cents, which we are thrilled about. Um, next, Andre. Um, if you just look at the different jurisdictions, um, you heard me talk about the revenue growth of 19.4%, but you know, I'm delighted that we were able to grow all the jurisdictions. So revenue growth in Botswana grew um, just over 11% to 5.7 billion. Um, Eswatini, we were able to grow revenue by over 16% to 1.69 billion. Namibia, um, we grew revenue by over 50% um, to 2.1 billion. And that is, um, you know, in some ways, um, um, because of the, the, the Talbot Corson um, acquisition, but also we had very strong organic growth in our Wito trading business. Um, South Africa, we were able to grow revenue by 11.5% to 1.532 billion. I think if you just look at the chart on the right-hand side, um, in 22, um, the geographic split was 54% of the revenue was Botswana, um, and then 15% from Namibia, South Africa, and Eswatini, respectively. Um, you know, I think that whilst Botswana is still a significant contributor to our business, it went from 54 to 50, and then Namibia is up at 19, South Africa, <clears throat> excuse me, South African, Eswatini, 15 and 14% respectively. If you look at all the other geographies, um, you know, we grew um, those geographies considerably and over 100%. If you look at Botswana specifically, um, you know, you heard me talk about the revenue growth, but we were very pleased with the EBIT growth of 20.3% to 269 million, which we thrilled about. I think that um, our a grocery distribution business um, um, got Master Distributor of the Year um, by a, uh, a significant brand owner. We were awarded the Heineken business last year. Um, we have rolled out more solutions um, in that geography. And we also um, started to provide one of the major retailers a solution for uh, what we would describe as house brands or um, confined label um, and uh, you know to take advantage of the growth in that area and then we continue our channel broadening strategy in that geography. Thank you. If you look at Eswatini, um, in addition to the revenue growth we were able to grow EBIT there by 33.8 percent to 145.3 million. Um, we delighted um, with the performance of this geography. Our grocery distribution business celebrated 20 years in business last year, which was a lovely milestone. Um, we um, are 
I guess, bumping ahead in terms of capacity, warehouse capacity that is um, in that geography. So we're commissioning um, a new facility there. Um, the last part is that it will be all under one roof. It will be purpose-built. So we expect um, you know, to deliver some efficiencies once we commission that facility and move in, uh, as well as you know, I think that from the ESG perspective, uh, it will enable us to accelerate our green energy ambitions in that geography as well. Um, <clears throat> our liquor distribution business was also awarded um, 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 new business um, and we continue to grow um, our brand portfolio there. If you look at Namibia, um, you know, I think you heard me talk about the, the significant revenue growth. Um, the EBIT, um, you know, it looks flattering growing at, at over 100%, which we've done, but um, we would still consider um, it to be so-called underperforming geography for, for us at 181 million. Uh, there were lots of costs in 2023 associated uh, with the acquisition. We had to do a lot of housekeeping. Um, we transitioned from um, um, a legacy uh, ERP system to SAP last year. There were some costs associated with that. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that we um, not only expecting revenue growth out of this geography in 24, um, but we expecting a growth in earnings as a result um, of the, uh, I guess, the, um, uh, the bedding down of those so-called legacy issues. So, um, you know, I, um, um, I'm fairly confident around the profitability of this geography. Although, you know, my view is that this is a, a very expensive geography in which to operate big distances, long lead times. And so the margin expectation for this geography um, um, you know, is uh, perhaps um, not quite what we would expect from others. Thank you, Mark. Um, South Africa, uh, you know, <clears throat> re-EBIT um, marginally to 150 million. Um, but our, our retail execution business um, in South Africa um, has done incredibly well. Um, it has been um, awarded um, business by um, a major um, alcoholic um, uh, you know, spirits uh, a brand owner, which has been significant. Um, awarded business um, from one of the leading um, South African food producers. Um, I think that this business has uh, been awarded top employer four years running, um, been awarded level 1B status. And um, of the 15,000 people we employ, um, you know, just over 12,000 would be employed in this business um, and <clears throat> is a significant contributor to our, our, our organization. And, um, you know, I think that because it's it's a people-focused business. Um, we invest heavily in capability here. And of the 12,000 people, over 7,000 of those receive formal training um, um, in, 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 in our PNS business. Thank you, Mark. If you look at all the other geographies, uh, Lesotho, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, um, you know, growing at over 100%, but um, again, um, off a fairly low base. Um, if you look at EBIT, um, you know, EBIT is significantly down in 22. That is by and large um, um, as a result of uh, um, foreign exchange losses of uh, probably close to um, 10 million in Zambia, albeit unrealized. But um, we are building a, a really nice solution um, in Zambia, and um, as I said to you previously, is that formal retail is growing significantly. Um, our clients are looking for us to provide more and more solutions in that geography, and I think that as we journey between now and 2026, um, we're going to see um, that business 
um, land more clients, get more momentum, and um, going to be a significant contributor to the group. Um, Lesotho has been fairly difficult geography for us to navigate because of trading licenses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we have dealt with the um, bureaucracy and the administration, which, um, like always, takes longer and costs more than anticipated. But um, you know, we really um, have built our new business pipeline significantly in Lesotho, um, and we're building momentum. Zimbabwe, we've expanded our facility there. And, uh, you know, whilst we um, all know it's a difficult geography to navigate, we've got good management in place. They understand the complexity and um, are very agile and respond accordingly. Thank you, Andrew. Um, right now, I'm going to hand over to France Rackett, um, who's the CFO for the group, um, to talk you through this. Thank you, France. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, uh, we've now just going to look at. Get, I'll just give you a high overview of the income statement, the primary accounts. Um, Duncan said we're going to go in detail. Um, I hope you guys are ready. Um, we're going to spend the whole two days to go every, through everything in detail if you want every detail. But um, if you look at the income statement, the full picture of the income statement here uh, um, highlights the revenue up 19.4%. Um, which we are very um, happy with. Um, organic growth was about 15% and new acquisitions contributed about 4%, which was mainly in uh, Namibia, the Tavo and Corsa uh, business. And if you look at the adjusted EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA up 17.3%, which is in line with revenue growth. And then we have profit of the tax and the 604 million, which is, a, which is skewed with the abnormal uh, gain on purchase, um, but we'll take the gain. Um, if you take that out, also um, good growth in line with revenue of about um, 17%. And then all of that flowed down through headline earnings where all the abnormals have been stripped out uh, with a nice growth there of 27.9%. The headline earnings per share growth is a little bit uh, lower because of the amount of shares that's been issued in previous years and which we have the full effect this year. Next slide, please, Andre. If you look at the balance sheet, balance sheet quite balanced. I think we've, we've got a quite uh, strong balance sheet. Um, if you see the um, biggest amounts is include is more your current assets and your current liabilities, uh, which is our working capital. We invest heavily in working capital, especially in our um, warehousing full, full service offerings in, in the neighboring countries. Um, uh, just quick on the assets, assets up with about 100, mil, 100 million. That's basically the Tarver and Corsa uh, properties that we that was part of the transaction that we acquired. And um, just um, if you look at that, the current asset split between inventory, trade, and other receivables, um, normal for our business. Um, we fund, uh, well, we don't want to say that, but in the debtors and creditors uh, are, are more in line, and stock is, uh, uh, we fund our stock separately. If you go to the next slide, please, Andre. This is more detail on the working capital. Working capital um, is quite healthy at this stage. We don't have any issues on our working capital. Um, it's a little bit uh, above uh, um, the revenue growth, but we are, uh, our year end is in a funny period, which is December month. People are usually not at work. Um, they don't want to pay it that day, they want to sit on the beach. But uh, we're comfortable. Most of those monies and everything is, is up to date. and. Uh, and I think it's in line with uh, with our uh, um, revenue growth. Next slide, please, Andre. In the cash flow, um, quite nice cash that we generated in the year of 291 million as fee. Um, working capital, we have invested in working capital, which is which is part of the growth we are in. And in taxes paid, which is a good thing. If you don't, if you pay taxes, it means we make money. And then the interest bill, uh, interest received, the net interest is that we, we are on an interest received side because of this strong balance sheet we have. 
the invest net investments of 68 million, mainly this the Tabo and Corsa amount of company that we bought in uh, Namibia and the South Africa business. As you see, the capital expenditure, very low capital capex expenditure for our group, which is in line with what we do because we are an asset light business. We try to be as light as possible. Uh, most of those expansions related to replacement of motor vehicles, trucks to do deliveries and here and there some racking that we had to invest in, in the new facilities that we uh, uh, moved into. Thank you very much everybody. I'm going to hand it over now back to Duncan. Um. <clears throat> Thank you Andre. Next slide. Um, you know, I think that you heard me talk about um, objective um, of getting um, a compound average growth rate of 20%. Um, our objective um, is to be a 20 billion rand business by 2026. Um, you know, I think that um, the message is, I guess, is that we're on track, um, we're pedaling hard, um, and, uh, you know, whilst um, it's significant growth, I think that we um, have the plans um, um, in place to uh, um, make the 20 billion a reality um, and we just got to make sure that we deliver for existing clients to implement the plans that we have in place and uh, you know I guess if we get a couple of lucky bounces along the way um, the 20 billion um, is certainly uh, achievable. Next Andre. So I think that um, you know, I think what we've focused on um, is to ensure that we continue to deliver for existing clients, is that we um, take existing clients to geographies where we don't currently service those clients. And if we just look at existing clients um, in existing geographies, um, that still represents an over a three billion rand opportunity for us. So it's about making sure that by performing in existing geographies, we get the opportunity to expand our services and geographies with these existing clients. We're working very hard on ensuring that we grow the bouquet of services that we provide to existing clients and are looking at acquisitions that can complement um, um, our existing business. If we just look at the um, history of the organization from 19 to 23, um, we've been able to grow revenue from 7.1 to the 11.3 billion I spoke of, but also um, whilst we focus on revenue growth, it's a proxy for profitable revenue growth. And then you'll see the margin from 19 from at 2.9 percent, 21 expanding to three and a half, 22 to four, and then last year at 5.3 percent. Admittedly, some of that was as a result of the gain and bargain purchase, um, but um, you know it's the objective we have set ourselves nonetheless. Thank you, Andre. I think that. You can see the history of the organization from 19 to 23. Um, you'll see the setback that we had between 20 and 21, which is the so-called COVID years. But um, we're back on track with the double-digit growth. And, uh, you know, notwithstanding something unforeseen, um, expect that um, growth to continue. And uh, that's what we wake up um, every day to try and do and believe that with the existing clients, with the plans that we have in place, that we are on track to achieve about 19 billion rand. And then with the acquisitions that we are working on um, to take us from the 19 to 20. Thank you, Andre. This is the same slide, but just talking about headline earnings per share. And uh, you can see that the headline earnings per share pretty much mirrors um, the revenue growth over the same period. Thank you, Andre. I think that, um, you know, just with regards to the outlook, you heard me talk about Southern Africa, East Africa, why are we doing what we are doing, why we have prioritized those markets. I think that, 
you know, we're not naive to the challenges, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that we have good people in place. We have excellent clients. Um, we have great knowledge of these geographies and these uh, these brands and what we need to do. And, uh, you know, I think that we're building momentum very, very nicely and are fairly optimistic, um, all things considered. Thank you, Andre. So um, I apologize for taking longer than expected, but, uh, you know, over to, the, to, to, to you for any questions. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Duncan. And I'm just going to hand you straight over to the finance ghost and Mark Tobin. Over to you, guys. Thank you, thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, everyone attending. Duncan Franz, thank you for your time as well. And congratulations on a share price that's up 75% in the past 12 months. Not a lot of companies that can say that. Uh, Duncan, I think you invented quite a, an excellent word earlier, which was a, a deliverant, which is the dividend that I think you get after a period of great delivery. I think you should lean into it and uh, keep paying deliverants. I, I might steal that from you at some point in ghost mail. <laughs> I think we can. I'm going to I'm gonna have to watch the recording. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so congratulations. I think let's jump into the, the questions. And obviously with your group, there are many ways to slice and dice this thing uh, by different brands, by different geographies, by some of the different service offerings. And I really appreciate it in this presentation, the detail you went into in the beginning on that stuff. I'd like to slice and dice it slightly differently and ask you a, a question just to further improve my understanding and the understanding of those on the call and just the customer resonance and, and what that purchasing decision actually looks like from a customer perspective. So if I'm a big brand, you know, you mentioned the Heineken, for example, you know, is it is it the case that you're solving one specific problem for me? Is it a logistics thing? You know, I need to hit a specific market. I need to get my stuff to market. Let me speak to these guys. And then when I'm a smaller business, a more sort of unusual FMCG player, you know, is the offering then typically more holistic? So does it work out on average that you do more services for smaller companies and then specific gaps for bigger ones? Or is there less of a trend? I just think it helps people further understand the business if they figure out, you know, why someone's hiring you. Like what happens in the boardroom before that happens where you become very relevant in their lives? Yeah. So, you know, I hope I've understood the question correctly, but both so-called smaller and larger brand owners um, require products on shelf, right? And so um, they're looking for credible providers um, that can deliver the so-called on-shelf availability. But, you know, um, without commenting specifically on Heineken, but if you look at um, the multinationals, um, they would um, want a service provider that is uh, operationally competent. But um, far more important than that is that they would look at um, um, the social systems. So in other words, how do we compensate people? Um, what does um, so-called equity look like in our organization? What does the BE level look like? What does our balance sheet look like? Will we be able to pay them? Um, are we a sustainable um, um, service provider? So there'll be all sorts of social systems that they would look at. Um, there would be a criteria around qualifying. And then in addition to that, can we do the job? Um, so I think that both the small and the large um, want on-shelf availability, but the ticket to the race um, is different for different brand owners based on their criteria. No, thanks. That is helpful. And it also speaks to moat. It's not so easy to go and land Heineken. I mean, one would guess this, but, you know, it makes sense. Of course. I mean, you know, obviously price is important, but uh, it's not only about price. And so, um, you know, there's, uh, the, 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 there's a, um, a fairly significant barrier to entry. That doesn't mean other people can't do it. Uh, I'm sure they can. And Duncan, just maybe a follow on to that question in terms of, you know, dealing with the different brands and ranges, is there a margin difference, you know, between whether you're working for Heineken versus, you know, Tiger Brands and FMCG versus Adcock Ingram in, you know, over the counter uh, pharma or, you know, Johnson Johnson personal care? Like, does it does it matter to you? 
what what you're dealing with um or is it you know in terms of price and you know the the service offering it doesn't matter what the underlying product is yeah you're just taking a view on okay what's the kind of cost to serve there yeah so, so mark you know i think that um there's no doubt that from the brand owner specific uh, a brand owner perspective um categories in margins or margin um, for different categories vary. So some categories are margin richer than others. Um, I think that goes without saying. But the brand owners we serve would operate across multiple categories. The way we price it is not based on category margin. We price it based on the, if I can call it, um, the share of voice, the amount of work we have to do, what is the expectation from the brand owner? And we would adopt a view um, on what sort of margin we need to have in order to be sustainable and profitable. So we do not vary based on a category margin, but rather um, what is required of us and how much resource it's going to soak up, frankly. Okay. I might just get a, a quick one in before um, we go back to the ghost. Uh, one in from the, the audience. Uh, the informal sector in South Africa, the, you know, to how does CANS plan to, uh, I guess, penetrate the informal retailer network? I mean, we all know, you know, these FASA shops, if you aggregate them all together, uh, you know, it's a huge, it's a huge market in itself. Um, and obviously some of the more FMCG brands, you know, obviously would love to, you know, get in there or probably are already are in there, maybe by a circuitous route, let's say, um, you know, where the individual spazer shop owner is buying in bulk from a distributor rather than, you know, you guys doing drop off deliveries. But maybe just talk about strategies around that informal sector. How does that flow back to, to, to CANS to some extent? Yeah. So, um, yes. Yeah, so we, are, you know, we um, operate in the modern trade environment where we service retailers and wholesalers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that has been our, um, if I can call it, um, um, traditional retail environment that we've serviced. But um, almost all our brand owners have wanted a credible solution in the so-called main market. Um, the main market. Um, has a myriad of service providers and we have looked at service providers but haven't been able to identify one that um, we believe is um, um, the right partner for us. Um, you may or may not know but we did the acquisition of Roots um, 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 earlier this year and they operate in the main market space. So we um, um, we did an, an acquisition where we bought 49% of the, of, of the business with an option to increase. And um, um, that's fairly new. And that is our, if I can call it, our solution to offer brand owners um, to capitalize, I guess, in on, on the underserviced retail environment in the main market. I want to jump in, Duncan, with something a little bit different, which is just talking to, you know, the business model seems to be quite a lot of disparate brands that operate quite autonomously in different places and with different client lists and all that kind of thing. I mean, latest acquisition, you've just talked to it is a non-controlling stake at this point with a pathway to control. So do you see yourself as staying in this relatively decentralized operation, um, you know, where a lot of these businesses are servicing their clients in country, et cetera, or do you see some kind of shared services model developing over time, uh, you know, a single view of the customer, having one, you know, one discussion with, I'm sorry, I keep using Heineken as an example, rightly or wrongly, across all its needs and countries. Uh, you know, how do you, what does the five year from now plan look like in your head in terms of, of that kind of thing? Yeah, you know, I think that um, it's a, 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 I feel like I, I walk a tightrope around this all the time. So uh, it's my view that, um, um, head offices um, must be careful um, that they become a, they don't become a hindrance and, and they, re, they remain a help. So generally speaking, um, we have very good operators. And so my view 
is to push the decision making down and give them um, an enormous amount of autonomy. But in return for that, they must take accountability, and they do. And so I think that the people that we employ in, in, in a thrive in an environment where um, they don't have um, um, this very, very tight um, uh, framework where they've got to come to head office for every decision. Um, so my view is that there are some non-negotiables. So if you look at our ERP systems, you look at finance, you look at digitization, those are very, very strong centralized systems. But when it comes to operations, who to employ, what um, who, um, uh, who to employ, how to deploy, which clients to take, pricing, um, those people are best placed to run with it. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but that's how we view it. So I think the cornerstone for us is um, the right people, decentralized management, and making sure that we have the right apple, right capital allocation in these environments. So I think that um, you know these jurisdictions have different cultures, um, and we need to um, respect and understand that. But there's very, very strong thread around a way of operating, culture, values. Those are central or uniform across the group. Uh, Duncan, just on, and we've, it's probably more pronounced um, overseas, but it's definitely creeping into the South African market. The, you know, expansion of house brands or own brands by, you know, the big retailers uh, more broadly. How does that kind of play into the mix of, um, you know, CNS's uh, offering? I mean, if we take a, you know, if I think of a business like Glibstar, they've got their own brands, but a lot of their stuff is producing own brand stuff for Woolworths and, and, and some of the other big retailers, but it still needs to get from manufacturing facilities into distribution centers, into individual stores. So maybe just talk about that, you know, changing dynamic where the retailers are trying to push more down what we've seen in Europe, the, the own brand, house brand model um, versus, you know, you dealing with big international brand owners. Yeah. So, so, you know, Mark, um, we, we see that in South Africa, um, dealer own brand or confined label probably makes up 20% of the basket and growing. So it's a, a big category. It's a growing category. Um, and from our perspective, it's far too big to ignore. Um, and, um, you know, I think that the dealer own brand is growing in quality and offering, offering and in many cases it's become a point of differentiation for the, for the retailer. Um, from a brand owner point of view, you've got some brand owners who have a view that we don't do house brands, we only do our own brands. And if they want to, if, if the retailer wants a house brand solution, they must go elsewhere. And then we have brand owners who have um, a different view. So in other words, they'll have their own brands and they will manufacture brands on behalf of the retailer to the retailer's specification. And so we have a mixture of those clients. You may or may not have picked up in the presentation is that in Botswana, we are providing um, the solution to one of the leading retailers around sourcing, warehousing and distributing of their, of their brands. Um, and we're seeing that um, um, revenue stream grow dramatically and we expect to expand that across all our geographies. So we have a very distinct um, strategy around capitalizing on the confined label dealer own brand model and making sure we walk the tightrope between conflict of interest between our existing clients and dealer own brands uh duncan maybe right, one for thanks. france uh, and just conscious of how much time we have left which is not a lot so if there's two financially orientated questions and i'm going to ask them both with a risk lens the first one talks to fixed assets so just how you think about owning your own dcs owning your own logistics infrastructure, you know, versus being more capital light. So let me frame it that way. And the other financial question, also risk-based, is African currencies, uh, MTN all over the headlines and all the challenges they've had. I mean, you mentioned Zambia earlier. I think the quacha over the past year and a half has made the RAND look like a great choice for widows and orphans. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to talk to you. Yeah, currency risk is one. And then how do you think about uh, fixed asset strategies as well? Uh uh, I think on fixed assets, uh, I mean, warehouses are usually a key strategic 
asset if you if you have a, a, a really big warehouse. Now, as you know, we have bought the uh, the warehouse in uh, Botswana in Gaborone. That is, uh, I think, that's the biggest warehouse in that whole town. So we will not move out of that facility. So that was strategic for us to acquire that. But if you go into other other markets, there is there is enough space available to rent. So why buy, build something, and lock capital in unless we can um, as, uh, as 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 we can re instead rent it? But we always look at it. It's a tight rope to walk as well, and. Um, and we do the calculations to see what is the benefit for our shareholders if we buy a business, if buy that uh, warehouse or rent it. But the, the preliminary is to look at renting warehouses, and you, it's also you don't lock value or store or, or, or money in that that country uh, in in those uh, structures. From the currency point of view, yes, um, Zambia is now our first real uh, forex exposure. Um, and very small at this stage, but we're managing it uh, through certain um, uh, pricings in when we pitch for business in these areas. And Franz, maybe if I can hold on to you for another uh, finance-related question, we'll give Duncan a break here. Um, working capital, we've seen a pickup in that, and I don't mean in, in absolute terms. I mean, you know, if you look at it as a percentage of sales, debtor days, creditor days, inventory, um, what is driving that? Is it customer product mix changes, or is it just the kind of general trading environment that, uh, you know, we're kind of operating in currently? Um, Mark, um the growth for us is it's a little bit higher than revenue growth. So I mean, it's a direct uh, uh, link to to revenue growth. I know you said that it's a percentage wise, but in theory, the, the, there was a little bit timing difference uh, in in uh, the year end. The year end was on a, on a Saturday, so uh, collections wasn't uh, as, uh, as as effective as it should have been. But uh, we're not really concerned of anything in the working capital need. The working capital book is uh, is, is healthy, Mark, um, and it's also a, a barrier of exit for some of our clients because we have a good uh, reputation of paying our customers on time, uh, our clients on time, and carry the book for them in their regions. Uh, one last yeah, question, my side, and then I think we're out of time, and it's hopefully a quick one. Uh, Duncan, you mentioned data earlier, which is obviously a fun word at the moment, second only to artificial intelligence, which uh, maybe you'll find a way to bring that into a presentation in a year or two and add another 3x to your multiple. I'm just kidding. But uh, with data and these platforms, it's often the case that the bigger a business becomes, just the better it becomes. You simply have more data. It scales in a way that is quite different to fixed assets. Is there an element of that to what you are building as well? Uh, there is an element to it, but um, you know, I think that as we get more data and we improve um, the insights, um, often the challenge for me is to commercialize it. So how do I sell the insights to an existing client? Because generally speaking, they um, expect you just to provide it. Um, so to commercialize it is the challenge. Um, so you know, the data that we are getting, um, the real benefit to us is around making sure that we are um, more efficient and operationally effective. So we've become a lot smarter around resource deployment, around stock turnover, um, you know, people to a store at different times of the day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the real benefit has come through operational efficiencies. We're trying to find ways of providing um, exponential value to brand owners that um, we get to a point where um, you know they are happy to part with some money uh, because of the insights that uh, are being provided. But right now, um, the quality of the data has improved, the insights have improved, but we haven't been able to commercialize it. Okay, I think we have kind of hit one o'clock and we've run out of time. So thank you to the Finance Ghost and Mark and to everyone who was on the call and especially to Duncan and Franz coming on to Unlock the Stock again. The recording will be on the web on the Unlock the Stock YouTube website early 
um, in the coming week. And then for everyone that's on the call, just a reminder that on Thursday, the 23rd of May, we'll be featuring another return stock, which is Calgro M3. Other than that, it's time to say goodbye and just to thank everyone who was on the call and Duncan and France once more. Thank you very much.